So what the topic we're talking about today is uh, what to do in the setting of non-muscle invasive bladder cancer after you've given BCG. This is an overview of what the uh, areas will cover. We'll talk about, start off with the various definitions of BCG failure. Then we'll talk about some of the predictors or response to BCG therapy. And so what are some of the simple modifiable methods that you can try to uh, use in your clinical everyday practice to try and improve this response. Discuss the rationale for nearly cystectomy and the bulk of the talk is on therapeutic options and a review of the literature in this area and on what to do for the patient that can't have a cystectomy or doesn't want to have a cystectomy. BCG is a life attenuated form of mycobacterium uh, bovis. An intravesicle BCG was used and first described in 1976. It is used as a first-line treatment uh, used after it uh, in the setting of high-risk non-muscle invasive bladder cancer. Here I have uh, listed a table taken from the EAU classification. So when we talk about high risk, we talk about <coughs> T1 disease or if they've got high-grade disease or the presence of carcinoma in situ or if they've got multiple and recurrent and large uh, TA, G1 or G2 tumours. It's an option also for the intermediate risk group as well. Uh, and uh, here it can be used with induction and maintenance and uh, you can use it with maintenance for up to a year. And the evidence has shown that it's more effective than chemotherapy in preventing recurrences but they're at the expense of slightly higher side effects uh, which, which are mostly bladder urinary side effects. The mechanism of BCG today is still not completely understood. It's presumed to impart an antineoplastic response by creating a local immune response in the bladder wall. BCG activated type 1 delay hypersensitivity response has been correlated with antitumoral activities. In addition, intravesical BCG also is found to uh, induce elevated cytokine levels and tumor necrosis factors in the uh, urine uh, of the patients following treatment. To date, uh, it's used twice as often as intravesical chemotherapy uh, in the US. This is the main rationale why we use PCG. First of all, we use it to treat coexisting carcinoma in situ. We're aiming to prevent or delay recurrences in this group of patients. and. Uh, Perhaps more importantly, we're trying to reduce progression uh, to muscle invasive bladder cancer by up to 40% as compared to uh, TYBT alone. <coughs> this is the response rate with the first course of BCG and induction and maintenance. So you get some, a 70%, up to 70% initial complete response rate. But within five years, if you follow these patients out, 40% of these patients experience recurrences in one way or the other. So if you give, with each BCG failure, the risk of progression to muscle invasive disease also increases. So at entry, they're, they're, the general risk, all, all, all part figure is about 7%. But that risk increases to up to 30% if you fail two or more courses of BCG therapy. And the last sentence here, you know, we give BCG to a lot of our patients, but as many as 20% of the patients discontinue BCG due to low core systemic side effects and therefore can't tolerate it and need to have some other form of treatment as well. The problem in the literature when you read it, read it and, and uh, review it is that there's no standardized definition for BCG failure and there's no uniform agreement. So that when you look at the uh, various large organizations, uh, I've sort of chosen three that we'll be talking about. There's minor variations in the definitions and and what to do. The EAU guidelines uh, in their latest uh, classification this year separates BCG failure from BCG intolerance. So in here, the uh, BCG failure, you get, uh, it includes when there's muscle invasive bladder tumor detected during follow-up. They incorporate BCG refractory under the umbrella term BCG failure. So if you get high-grade non-muscle invasive papillary tumor present at three months, you know, they, they sort of put that under the BCG failure category. And if you've got carcinoma in situ present at 
both three month and at the six month mark, that's considered BCG failure. Or uh, if you've got high grade recurrences after BCG therapy, that's uh, also BCG failure. The International Bladder Consultation on Bladder Tumor, uh, quite a m number of years ago, uh, came up with these four terms uh, to incorporate the umbrella term BCG failure. Is easy failure. So here they talk about. Yeah, I think that's a that's an important uh, fact point thing to point out. Um, you know, I often lump these patients in our heads together, and you know, if they're given BCG induction, they've had any sort of recurrences. But if they've got low grade recurrence, they're a different risk group, so they they shouldn't automatically go to a susceptible. So uh, the international bladder consultation uh, on bladder tumor came up with these four terms: intolerance is where you know they're intolerant of BCG and the side effects. Resistance is where they get recurrence or persistence of a lesser degree or grade after the initial course and then they re resolve and then the disease uh, goes away with further BCG. Relapsing here is uh, achieving a disease-free status uh, by six months and then the disease coming back. So here they talk about, uh, they break it down into less than 12 months which is what, which what we talked about, which is early recurrence and that's got a higher risk of uh, recurrence and progression to the patient. Uh, intermediate risk, so 12 to 24 months. And again, and then the late recurrences, the ones that are, uh, relapse after 24 months. And the disease free interval has prognostic significance here. So that late relapses, anything more than two years, may benefit from repeated BCG, whereas early relapsing disease less than a year is more likely to progress. BCG refractory here, they, uh, it's uh, it non-improving on worsening disease despite BCG therapy. So failure to achieve disease-free state by six months or any progression in grade or disease or disease extent or stage by the three months mark after the first cycle of BCG therapy. They make the important distinction uh, between recurrences and treatment failure, where treatment failures uh, <coughs> any recurrences that occurs after, after uh, that occurs during intravesical therapy. <coughs> this is a Canadian Urological Association uh, 2010 guidelines and they've adopted this definition from Harry Herr's paper in uh, 2003. So here uh, BCG failure is defined as the presence of high-grade non-muscle invasive bladder cancer at six months from TURBT uh, or any worsening of disease um, whilst on BCG therapy despite initial response to BCG. We can see from these uh, three large organisations that there's varying definitions between the various organisations. Whilst they all take into account the timing of BCG failure, the definitions themselves do not reflect the type of BCG schedule administered or the primary indication for BCG therapy. So we need to uh, separate the, the so and, and distinguish. The, so the concept of refractory low-grade disease is completely different from high-grade papillary non-muscle invasive bladder cancer or COS. And so the implication of disease recurrence differs if you use BCG for high-grade non-muscle invasive bladder cancer from the outset, or those that use it for low or intermediate risk group patients. It's nice to have a crystal ball uh, to be able to predict who is going to respond to BCG therapy and who isn't. At the present moment, while we've got, uh, we can work out the risk of recurrence and progression, we don't really have good tools of predicting which patients are going to respond to BCG therapy and who's better off with an immediate cystectomy. We'll rely on a combination of clinical pathological and uh, molecular and immunological parameters to try and help make this decision. And each of these parameters is associated with increased risk 
but exact quantitative nature is unclear at this stage. This is a summary side of all the pathological factors that are implicated uh, with higher risk groups. So if you've got carcinoma in situ, particularly in the prostatic urethra, if you've got a deeper lamina propria invasion or multifocal disease, um, recurrent diseases as well. Lymphovascular invasion is something that I've learned whilst I'm doing, I was researching this topic. It's not always diagnosed or reported by our local pathologist back at home at least. Um, and when these characteristics are present on the T or RBT specimen, even in the setting of TA or T1 disease, the probability of progression is actually higher. So that in these patients, the probability of having positive lymph nodes at the time of diagnosis is up to 8 to 10 percent. Lastly, the last two uh, pathological factors are detectable disease at the three month mark and uh, timing of failure, which we have already talked about. A lot of these are largely non modifiable diseases that you can't really change. Clinical factors, uh, older age, again, another non modifiable factor you can't change because the immune system weakens with age. It's not surprising, age has been found to be a prognostic factor. So in a recent study, uh, like I came across 27% of the patients aged more than 70 were more likely to be disease free at five years compared to 37% of patients aged less than 70. This is just in a one particular group. Female sex is associated with a worse response as well. And the last two factors, uh, BCG maintenance and strains of BCG, I'll elaborate in the next few slides. So um, when we give BCG therapy these days, we really need to give it with induction a main and maintenance course. As uh, adding maintenance, it's been shown in this day and age to, uh, to uh, increase the durability of disease uh, response, both in terms of recurrence and progression. And so for intermediate risk group, that you can should really take the patients out to one year. And for high risk group, it's, it's ideal to take it up to three years, but at the, at the minimum, they should try and tolerate it for one year maintenance therapy. What about the question of BCG strain? Um, in the past, uh, all the literature that we've had uh, suggests that BCG strains are equal. And perhaps some, but perhaps some strains are more equal than others. This is an article that was published uh, recently in the European Urology. Um, that suggests a particular strain of BCG may have a uh, better response rate uh, to bladder cancer recurrences. So there are more than seven types of strains of BCG uh, out there uh, used in the contemporary era. In the 1984, when BCG uh, Pasteur was withdrawn from the market in Switzerland, uh, that left at that time uh, the Connaught strain and the Thai strain as the only two available options. So the authors of that paper, which I we're talking about now, sensed an opportunity to evaluate the efficacy of these two strains, and they said they designed a prospective randomized trial <coughs> of 100, and they recruited and uh, had follow-up for 132 patients, where half of them received Connaught strain and half of them received BCG Thai strain at six-week weekly induction course therapy only. And uh, they reported the five-year recurrence-free survival uh, right at 74% for, for the Connell strain and then 48% for the Tice strain. And this was statistically significant. However, progression free survival and overall survival wasn't significantly uh, different in this group of patients. This is the second time the Tice strain of BCG therapy has been compared with another BCG strain. Earlier on, the Dutch cooperative trial also compared uh, BCG Tice strain with. BCG, a Dutch BCG preparation, and they uh, found no difference between the strains, but hinted also at the possible inferiority of the Tice strain or BCG. This is an overview table of all the studies that have compared the various strains of BCG therapy. As you can see in the boxes in green, uh, you know, all these studies were either underpowered uh, to detect a clinical significance, or they ran into troubles with uh, BCG production issues. And up until this late, latest study that we've, that, that's just come out. <clears throat> One of the other factors is that uh, of why I think uh, we're not able to predict BCG response is that 
at the current imaging techniques for staging are inadequate for micrometastatic disease. So they're, they're, we base it. We base the fact that they're on. They've got high risk disease based on what we've resected or what we've biopsied in the uh, TURBT specimens, and, and in general, to what we can see with a staging CTRVP. But we know from the long term outcomes of these patients receiving cystectomy for T1 disease that there's a degree of uh, understaging here, and even in the setting of T1 disease, sometimes a small percentage of patients have micrometastatic disease that we're really not being able to detect or appreciate uh, at, at the outset. <coughs> what are some of the things we can do? And, the, and, and, and this, uh, these are simple things that we can do in everyday practice um, that can help make a difference. Um, you know, if you've got an incomplete resection, which uh, non, no muscles in the first resection, T1 or high grade disease, these patients should and uh, or to have a second TURBT. <coughs> the purpose of this is uh, several folds. Uh, first of all, you, we're eradicating residual tumour. So this is uh, a systematic review by Dr. Vinello, which has shown that in TA disease, persistent tumour overall in all the literature is present in up to 39% of patients. And in 47% of patients in T1 disease have persistent tumour on their second TURBT specimen. So the second TRPT, second purpose is to decrease understaging. If no muscle is present in the specimen, uh, 20 to 40% of patients will have residual tumour or unrecognised muscle invasive disease on the second TRPT uh, specimen. And, uh, and so we're, uh, the risk of understaging is in excess of 50% if you were to just do, rely your information based purely on the first TRPT. Lastly, by doing the second TRBT, you're actually reducing the patient's overall risk of recurrence and progression. In a study over at Memorial Sloan, catering over 1,000 patients, the recurrence rate reduced with the second TRBT from 58% to uh, 28% uh, between those that have and have not had a TRBT, the second TRBT. So that overall, a single TUR was associated with a two-fold increased risk of recurrence at five years with the greatest risk of 4.5 fold at the three months mark, which would suggest that you're really missing. Um, it's a, it's, a, it's a really an incomplete resection at the first resection. Carcinoma in situ. Uh, surprising to me when I was researching the topic that there's a significant variability amongst pathologists for the diagnosis of this, and that complete agreement is only achieved in up to 70 to 78 percent of the cases. Even for stage and grade of disease, inter-observer variability between pathologists uh, in, uh, is also, uh, you know, there's conformity issues of reporting. Uh, and in the literature, they quoted at sort of 50 to 60 percent. So in difficult cases, uh, you should get an experienced genital urinary pathologist to review your pathology, as this can have a uh, great impact on patient outcomes. And this is something simple that you can do in a multidisciplinary setting. These are some of the markers uh, used to predict response therapy. Now the fish uh, fluorosis in situ hybridization uh, can be performed and you can use a Eurovision bladder cancer kit that's commercially available. One prospective trial has uh, shown that patients who have got a positive fish result during BCG therapy was three to five times more likely than those with a negative fish test through experienced recurrence and five to 13 times more likely to have disease progression. A review of other potential uh, markers or response has found that measurement of cytokine levels such as urinary cytokine interleukin 2, 8 and 18 um, as well as tumor necrosis factor may hold some promise in the assessment of BCG therapy outcome. The same holds for immunohistochemical biomarkers and uh, single nucleotide polymorphism in cytokines or in genes involved in DNA repair, but these tests really need further investigation and validation. As an example, this is a study published uh, this year in the Euro Urologic Oncology Journal by Dr. Kang and colleagues. The authors looked at uh, glutathione transferase uh, polymorphism by PCR 
using blood genomic DNA from patients with primary non-muscle invasive bladder cancer. We were treated with a single induction course of BCG therapy. Now this enzyme encoded by these genes are involved in the metabolism of a wide range of carcinogens that are in the environment. And patients found to carry uh, GSTT1 positive genotype showed a 14-fold increase of early BCG failure compared to those that had uh, a negative result and suggested that it could be used in the future, potentially, with further study as an independent predictor of BCG th failure. The problem with all these markers is that the threshold for using a biological or genetic marker to guide a patient to an early cystectomy is very high since the implications are actually very, very significant. So we really need more numbers and more confirm uh, confirmatory studies uh, before these can come into clinical practice. So I, th I think of it as a sort of... Uh, patients go along this, uh, <coughs> this, uh, this, 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 this line pathway and you give them induction course therapy and, uh, and maintenance and some of them, uh, and they should all have a second course, second uh, TYBT induction and maintenance therapy but some of them will eventually have recurrences and, uh, and, the, and the default position, if they've got you know, high, the real recurrences that we, as we alluded to earlier is the cystectomy. So once they're deemed to have BCG failure, uh, radical cystectomy is the <coughs> default position if the patient's otherwise fit and informed. We know that uh, cystectomy before progression to muscle invasive disease, um, if you do a cystectomy at the moment that they recur, the cancer specific survival is excellent in excess of 90%. However, if you wait until they uh, subsequently pro progress to muscle invasive bladder cancer, that uh, survival drops by a, a lot. Um, so in, in matched cohorts, uh, if they got muscle invasive disease after they've uh, failed BCG therapy, um, and with delays, their uh, three-year cancer-specific survival is about 37% compared to if they're presented up front with muscle-invasive bladder cancer, which is where their three-year survival is uh, 67%. Here, I think a component of this is largely due to uh, understaging and unappreciated micrometastatic disease. So really just delaying and allowing for the natural history of that to occur. Even when you perform a radical cystectomy in the setting of presumed non-muscle invasive bladder cancer, the formal pathological and clinical outcomes are still undesirable. Uh, you get upstaging in 20 to 30 percent of the cases, presence of lymph nodes in 10 percent of the cases, and uh, you know 10 percent of these patients uh, will eventually go on to die from bladder cancer. Our uh, Western population is increasing. Uh, getting increasingly healthy and the patients are living more, longer and longer so um, we're going to come across more patients that uh, are, are unfit after BCG failure or they, they, might, they express a strong desire to preserve their bladder regardless of the options you put in front of them. So the first thing you should inform is that treatment at this stage other than the cystectomy must be considered oncologically inferior at the present time and uh, but there are other options uh, for these group of patients. And they, these include immunotherapy, chemotherapy, device-assisted therapy, and uh, sequential combinations of these therapy. The main outcome measures used in most of these studies is a three-month uh, response, where complete response is that if they have a cystoscopy and biopsy and it's negative, and have a negative cytology, they have a partial response, where they have negative biopsies but positive cytology, um, and uh, I, I think, but I think ultimately what we all want uh, to see from these studies, I'm not, I'm not sure whether we're going to get it, uh, is cancer specific survival from these studies and comparing it to early cystectomy data. In the following slides I'll, I'll highlight some of the key response rate of various agents in red and uh, the outline survival data if they're, if they're available. So interferon and BCG. Interferon is a naturally occurring uh, cytokine that's produced by the immune system in response to insults such as tumor cell growth. Early dose escalation studies uh, have gone up to 10,000 milli million units and the maximum tolerated dose was never reached. What we use every day uh, in clinical practice is 50 million units. 
and biocompatibility between BCG and interferon has been established. It works by, uh, it's thought to work by changing the balance between T helper 1 and T helper 2 cytokine production in, the, in, the, in favor of T helper 1 and down regulates angiogenesis related genes and induces apoptosis or upregulation of TNF related apoptosis inducing ligand. Earlier studies uh, of 12 patients showed 75% complete response rate at three months, and 50% of these patients were disease free at one year. And uh, other, other, other earlier studies of 20 patients showed again 60% remained disease free at 22 months, and another group, 40 patients, uh, of four, in 40 patients, 63% remained disease free at 12 months, and 24, 53% at two year mark. This is a largest study uh, on interferon of a phase two trial, multi centered trial of over 1,000 patients. And amongst this group of patients, there was 467 patients with previous BCG failure. <clears throat> and out to a 24 month median follow up, uh, interferon plus reduced dose BCG, 45% uh, of the patients were disease free at the 24 month mark. This compares. <coughs> This is uh, th this this is this is uh, this concludes the phase two study. This is overall they 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 they, okay. so they included phase two patients. Oh, fa yeah. 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 I got stand corrected. Um, it compares favorably with uh, to thirty five percent disease free. Uh, state for second course species therapy following BCG refractory cases in a cohort by Dr. O'Connor. At the current moment, there's no randomized study between interferon B plus BCG versus BCG and BCG failure patients. In this group of patients, sub subsequent sub uh, subgroup analysis has shown that uh, uh, these are the predictors of BCG of, of failure. So if they've failed within a year, if they've got large tumors, Multifocality, if they've got T1 disease or they're older. So, if you've got a patient uh, with BCG failure more than two years out without many of these features, you can consider use of uh, BCG in to together with interferon therapy. These are the four chemotherapy options available, and that's been studied extent, uh, to some extent in the literature. Now, Ribosin is the, uh, an FDA approved uh, therapy for BCG refractory CIS in patients who are not candidates for cystectomy. <clears throat> this is the only FDA approved agent uh, following uh, a study by Dr. Steinberg in 2000 of ni 90 patients. They compared, uh, they reported a 21% complete response rate at three months and this drops down to 2% at two year at the 30 month mark. Uh, Despite its approval, it hasn't really taken off. There's not, not much enthusiasm for it. Uh, and the second study by Dr. Dini showed similar results uh, with sort of similar numbers. So 4% at two year mark and 18% at uh, three month mark. And there's a cystectomy rate of up to 25% in, in the series by Dr. Dini. Gemcitabine is the second chemotherapy agent. We know it's used effectively when used in metastatic bladder cancer in the new adjuvant setting. So this uh, causes us to bring it back to the intravocycle use and see whether or not it works. Phase one trials tested uh, mainly side effect profile and identified uh, very low local systemic local uh, side effects with the intravocycle gem cytobine. Phase two studies uh, looked at gem cytobine used in the induction setting only. And uh, in this series by Dr. Bag Bag uh, Del Bagney, 50% uh, uh, had a complete response rate at three months mark, and this number dropped down to 21% at the one year mark. So it's a slightly better response rate, but a uh, pretty high failure rate at, when you follow these patients out to one to two year mark. What about comparing gemcitabine versus mitomycin in this setting? This is a phase three study looking at the two and uh, they're comparing six week induction cause of gemcitabine versus four week mitomycin. So they're not comparing sim similar schedules. But uh, with this comparison, they uh, it's reported 72% in the gemcitabine group had recurrence free state uh, versus 61% uh, at a median follow up of three years. 
What about gemcitabine versus BCG therapy? Um, here, gemcitabine group had a better recurrence-free survival compared to further BCG therapy, so it's 19% at two years versus 3%. This study suggests that gemcitabine might be better uh, versus, compared to second-course therapy, but again, we need uh, more confirmatory and larger numbers uh, to confirm this. We use BCG therapy with induction and maintenance, so what about uh, using it in the setting of post BCG failure in, 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 in gemcitabine. So the SWOGS trial uh, added gemcitabine maintenance scheduled to, in addition to uh, induction course therapy. And in 42 patients, <coughs> and these are uh, mostly high risk group, 42 of them will fall into the high risk group. Uh, <coughs> and the majority of the these patients uh, were in the sort of poor prognosis group. So. So they had disease recurrence and relapse within 12 months of their last BCG therapy. If you add uh, maintenance, so that recurrence-free survival improves to 28% at one year and 21% at two years. This is compared to if, if you use gemcitabine induction alone, so slightly, slightly increased from 21% to 28%. So here, 36% of the patients had cystectomy. There was eight deaths. Uh, None of them in this series uh, died from metastatic bladder cancer. And even with maintenance therapy, we can see less than 30% had durable response rate at uh, the one year mark. Memorial of Sloan Kettering again looked at it and uh, used induction course and uh, maintenance course gemcitabine. Here they've pre reported survival data uh, in their cohort of patients. <coughs> And uh, it's 88% out at five years, and that's in patients with complete response rate to gemcitabine. And 82% uh, it with no, no com in the group with no complete response rate. So this is all in the setting of uh, uh, introducing cystectomy in patients that are otherwise you know, fit for a cystectomy. Ultimately, the determination of whether or what the ideal schedule and relative uh, effective maintenance treatment requires uh, more, more, more studies and more numbers. What about taxa and chemotherapy? It's been only studied in phase one uh, trials. Also, taxa has been looked at mainly by the uh, one center in the US. And uh, hackley taxa has been looked at mainly by one center in Italy. And they all show uh, a grade one and, or grade two uh, local toxicity with no appreciable grade three or grade four toxicity when used as an intravocycle agent. This is a combination, uh, again, pooled analysis of earlier trials uh, where they pulled 54 patients receiving intravocycle docetaxel in the BCG uh, refractory group. They all received uh, induction course BCG therapy. And then those with a complete response were offered maintenance therapy up out to uh, 12 months. This is a high risk group, so 87% of their patients uh, would fall into the high risk uh, basket. And again, similar poor uh, response rate when you follow them up long term. So out to three years, recurrence-free survival of 25%. When you follow up to five years, uh, down to 71% uh, disease-free survival. In a subset of patients that had <coughs> cystectomy, uh, they, they, in this group of patients, so they will be considered what we call delayed cystectomy, their five-year survival rate was uh, 82%. Recent work uh, have recognized the potential to maximize the therapeutic benefits by adding uh, plaxitaxel chemotherapy to mucoadhesive nanoparticles. This uh, is said to uh, improve drug dilution uh, by the urine and maintains high drug levels. And so this is where uh, this area of research is heading towards at the current moment. <coughs> what about mitomycin? So we can use mitomycin alone following BCG therapy failure or uh, we can use device-assisted therapy. So uh, if you use mitomycin alone, this is a, uh, <coughs> they're, they're out at three years, a disease-free state is about 19%, so very poor. What about mitomycin with elect EMDA, so with at adding current and electricity? It's been looked at by the SACES group uh, in the BCG naive cohort, which is shown that this combination is equal to BCG therapy uh, in terms of recurrence-free rate. Uh, and superior to passive standard uh, mitomycin. 
hasn't really been looked at and there's no data available in this BCG failure cohort at the present moment. What about if you use mitomycin and you add heat to it? So a concept uh, is termed chemohypothermia. Uh, here uh, it's a commercial available system produced by Synergo. The applicators uh, heats up the bladder wall by intravesical microwave application to about 42 degrees and you've got thermometers uh, in this catheter that measures the temperature in different areas of the bladder surface and the uh, the intravesical agents circulated uh, in this closed circuit and there's solutions as well to cool the uh, urethra to prevent overheating of the urethra. Several reasons why, uh, potential reasons why mitomycin might work better. One explanation is that heat increases the penetration of mitomycin to the urethelium. Secondly, uh, hypothermia is directly, maybe directly, hypothermia uh, might be directly of course, uh, direct cytotoxicity uh, may, uh, in combination with uh, mitomycin, may uh, alter the intracellular metabolism and damage DNA. And lastly, chemohypothermia has been shown to uh, increase the cytotoxicity of mitomycin, making the drug itself more uh, effective. Results in the BCG failure cohort uh, has been heterogeneous. Some studies have shown that uh, <clears throat> between BCG failure group and BCG naive group, chemohypothermia, the, the, there's no difference in the, in the recurrence rate. And uh, some studies have shown that BCG failure fared worse. These are the two main studies that have looked at chemohypothermia um, <clears throat> in the both induction and maintenance schedule. Um, most of these, 77% you know, were the high risk group, 20, two thirds were in the high risk group in the second study. And the numbers are somewhat much better than what we've talked about earlier on. So out to one year, 85% recurrence-free survival uh, in one study and 60% in the other study. <coughs> and disease-free survival um, out at uh, uh, about two years is some, in the order of about 40%. <coughs> There's phase three studies underway at the present moment, one in Europe, and uh, looking at uh, BCG compared to chemohypothermia in the high risk group, and one in the UK, uh, comparing, uh, looking at, at it from the BCG failure cohort. And both are uh, uh, due to have been uh, completed uh, recruiting uh, towards the end of last year, but couldn't find any updated uh, data on whether or not recruitment is complete this day. So this is an interesting area of space. Looking at several, I think up to a thousand. <coughs> what are some of the other novel agents? You can combine any of these agents. You can combine gemcitabine with <coughs> uh, with mitomycin, <coughs> uh, intravesical mycobacterium cell wall DNA complex can be used as well. Uh, one of the centers in Canada uh, looked at this, and uh, some some of the some of the uh, the early results from their phase three studies reported a, a recurrence-free survival uh, at one of, at one year of 25 percent. <clears throat> you can also combine uh, in, and use it in the intravesical gene therapy. Um, has also been looked at. And you, this approach looks at using adenovirus vector to include include a gene product to uh, to make. Uh, uh, interferons and uh, this is also a promising area so instead of giving intravesical interferon you uh, you give you give you give it uh, by this gene vector at the current moment CUA guidelines um, there's no real recommendations here they've got if you in a high risk group um, if you fail BCG therapy the question mark as to whether or not you can use and trial BCG interferon therapy but there's no real recommendations some of the issues in research and FDA approval in this there was a session hosted at the AUA last year that talked about it. <coughs> what, what, you know, if you con conduct a phase through randomized tr controlled trial, what is a comparator you use? Do you use early cystectomy as a comparator? In, in which case, you're going to get problems with randomization because patients don't really want the choice between cystectomy and intravenous agents de decided by randomization. Do you use valrubicin or do you use BCG? Another course of BCG th uh, therapy as the comparator uh, in phase three randomization. Also, there's because there's problems in BCG definitions. Um, 
you know, you need to come up with a standardized uh, BCG definition, failure, uh, failure definition. And also, what do you use as the clinically significant outcome measure in your study? Do you use failure at three months, uh, or do you, do, you, do, you, do you use it at 12 months? At, and I, a lot of these studies use uh, recurrence-free survival as a marker and surrogate for progression, ultimately survival. Um, and I think that's all we're going to get, because I don't, I don't think it, uh, it's difficult and challenging to wait until they progress to muscle-invasive disease before you flick them off study and uh, offer them cystectomy in a trial setting. <coughs> so in conclusion, uh, BCG failure group is a heterogeneous group mm -hmm. and there's no universally agreed definition. Um, uh, there's combinations of clinical pathological factors we can use in everyday practice that can help somewhat <coughs> uh, guide us to, to, to uh, help patients decide. Cystectomy remains the uh, default gold standard uh, for high-risk group in patients with failed BCG therapy. The response rate to in salvage intravesical therapy after BCG therapy failure varies, generally in the order of 15 to 40 uh, percent when you follow them up. It's, at this stage, it's considered investigational. And there's very limited evidence uh, on which option is mostly beneficial, most beneficial. And I, but I think uh, you know, if we use BCG as an example, I think I suspect uh, we need in this group of patients we need to use both induction and maintenance course of whatever agent we we eventually uh, choose to use uh, if if they have demonstrated to uh, show complete response rate uh, at the three months at the six months mark. Thank you.